Denver, Colorado, USA. My train is late. The western drawbridge is being tested. Todd Wainio doesn't seem to mind waiting for me at the platform. We shake hands under the station's mural of victory, easily the most recognizable image of the American experience in World War Z. Originally taken from a photograph, it depicts a squad of soldiers standing on the New Jersey side of the Hudson River. Their backs turn to us as they watch dawn break over Manhattan. My host looks very small and frail next to these towering, two-dimensional icons. Like most men of his generation, Todd Wainio was old before his time. With an expanding paunch, receding graying hair, and three deep parallel scars down the side of his right cheek, it would be difficult to guess that this former U.S. Army infantryman is still, at least chronologically, at the beginning of his life. The sky was red that day. All the smoke, the crap that had been filling the air all summer, it put everything in this amber-red light, like looking at the world through hell-colored glasses. That's how I first saw Yonkers, this little depressed, rust-collar burb just north of New York City. I don't think anybody had ever heard of it. I sure as hell hadn't. And now it's up there with, like, Pearl Harbor. No, not Pearl. That was a surprise attack. This was more like Little Bighorn, where we... Well, at least the people in charge, they knew what was up, or they should have. The point is, it wasn't a surprise. The war, or emergency, or whatever you want to call it, it was already on. It had been, what, three months since everyone jumped on the panic train? You remember what it was like, people just freaking out, boarding up their houses, stealing food, guns, shooting everything that moved. They probably killed more people, the Rambos and the runaway fires and the traffic accidents and just the, the whole shitstorm that we now call the Great Panic. I think that killed more people at first than Zack. I guess I can see why the powers that be thought that one big stand-up battle was such a good idea. They wanted to show the people that they were still in charge, get them to calm the hell down so they could deal with the real problem. I get it. And because they needed a propaganda smackdown, I ended up in Yonkers. It wasn't the worst place to make a stand. Part of the town sat right in this little valley, and right over the West Hills you had the Hudson River. The Sawmill River Parkway ran right through the center of our main line of defense, and the refugees streaming down the freeway were leading the dead right to us. It was a natural choke point, and it was a good idea. <laughs> the only good idea that day. Wainio reaches for another cue, the homegrown American variety cigarette so named for its one-quarter tobacco content. Why didn't they put us on the roofs? They had a shopping center, a couple of garages, big buildings with nice flat tops. They could have put a whole company right above the A&P. We could have seen the whole valley, and we could have been completely safe from the attack. There was this apartment building, about 20 stories, I think. Each floor had a commanding view of the freeway. Why wasn't there a rifle team in each window? You know where they put us? Right down on the ground, right behind sandbags or in fighting holes. We wasted so much time, so much energy preparing these elaborate firing positions. Good cover and concealment, they told us. Cover and concealment? Cover means physical protection, conventional protection from small arms and artillery or airdropped ordnance. That sound like the enemy we were about to go up against? Was Zack now calling in airstrikes and fire missions? And why the hell were we worried about concealment when the whole point of the battle was to get Zack to come directly at us? So back asswards, all of it. I'm sure whoever was in charge must have been one of the last of the Fulda fucktards. You know, those generals who spend their Nardrop years training to defend West Germany from Ivan. Tight ass, narrow-minded, probably pissed off from so many years of brush fire war. He must have been an FF because everything we did freaking stunk of Cold War static defense. You know they even tried to dig fighting holes for the tanks? The engineers blasted them right out of the A&P parking lot. You had tanks? <laughs> Dude, we had everything. Tanks, Bradleys, Humvees armed with everything from 50 cals to these new Vasilik heavy mortars. At least those might have been useful. We had Avenger Humvee-mounted Stinger surface-to-air missile sets. We had this AVLB portable bridge layer system, perfect for the three-inch deep creek that ran by the freeway. We had a bunch of XM electronic warfare vehicles, all crammed with radar and jamming gear. And Oh, yeah, we even had a whole FOL, family of latrines, just plopped right there in the middle of everything. Why? 
when the water pressure was still on and the toilets were still flushing in every building and house in the neighborhood. So much we didn't need. So much shit that only blocked traffic and looked pretty. And that's what I think they were really there for, just to look pretty. For the press. Hell yeah. There must have been at least one reporter for every two or three uniforms. On foot and in vans, I don't know how many news choppers must have been circling. <laughs> You'd think with so many, they'd spare a few to try and rescue people from Manhattan. Hell yeah, I think it was all for the press. Show them our big green kill power. Or tan. Some were just back from the desert. They hadn't even been repainted yet. So much of it was for show. Not just the vehicles, but us as well. They had us in M.O.P.P., dude. Mission-oriented protective posture. Big bulky suits and masks that are supposed to protect you from a radioactive or biochem environment. Could your superiors have believed the undead virus was airborne? If that's true, why didn't they protect the reporters? Why didn't our superiors wear them or anyone else immediately behind the line? They were cool and comfortable in their BDUs while we sweated under layers of rubber, charcoal, and thick, heavy body armor. And what genius thought to put us in body armor anyway? Because the press reamed them for not having enough in the last war? Why the hell do you need a helmet when you're fighting a living corpse? Shit, they're the ones that need helmets, not us. And then you get the net rigs, the Land Warrior Combat Integration System. It was this whole personal electronic suite that allowed each one of us to link up with each other and the higher-ups to link up with us. Through your eyepiece, you could download maps, GPS data, real-time satellite recon. You could find your exact position on a battlefield, your buddies' positions, the bad guys. You could actually look through the video camera on your weapon or anyone else's to see what's over a hedge or around a corner. Land Warrior allowed every soldier to have the information of an entire command post and let the command post control those soldiers as a single unit. Netrocentric. <laughs> That's what I kept hearing from the officers in front of the cameras. Netrocentric and hyperwar. Cool terms. But they didn't mean shit when you're trying to dig a fighting hole with MOPP gear and body armor and land warrior and standard combat load and all of it on the hottest day in what was one of the hottest summers on record. I can't believe I was still standing when Zack began to show up. It was just a trickle at first. Ones and twos staggering between the abandoned cars that jammed the deserted freeway. At least the refugees had been evacuated. Okay, that was another thing they did right. Picking a choke point and clearing the civilians. Great job. Everything else? <laughs> Zach started entering the first kill zone, the one designated for MLRS. I didn't hear the rockets launch. My hood muffled the noise, but I saw them streak towards the target. I saw them arch on their way down as their casings broke away to reveal all those little bomblets on plastic streamers. They're about the size of a hand grenade, anti-personnel with a limited anti-armor capacity. They scattered amongst the Gs, detonating once they hit the road or an abandoned car. Their gas tanks went up in like little volcanoes, geysers of fire and debris that added to the steel rain. <laughs> I gotta be honest, it was a rush. Dudes were cheering in their mics. Me too, watching ghouls start to tumble. I'd say there were maybe 30, maybe 40 or 50 zombies spread out across this half-mile stretch of freeway. The opening bombardment took out at least three quarters of them. Only three quarters? Yep, and that's what should have made us worry right then and there. Steel rain hit each and every single one of them, shredded their insides. Organs and flesh were scattered all over the damn place, dropping from their bodies as they came toward us. But headshots, you're trying to destroy the brain, not the body. And as long as they got a working thinker and some mobility, <laughs> some were still walking, others too thrashed to stand were crawling. Yeah, we should have worried, but there wasn't time. <laughs>